Today is August 13th, 2013, and we are interviewing Roy Dolgas at the Illinois State Library. Um, Roy was born December 3rd, 1944 in um, New Jersey, and um, my name is Cheryl Walker, and I will be interviewing Roy. Roy, could you state for the record what war and branch of service you served in? I served in uh, uh, the United States Army <coughs> and served in Vietnam. Okay, and what years were you in I the I was there Army? April 66 to April 68 in the service, in the service. Okay. And I was in Vietnam from November 66 to November 67. Okay, and what uh, unit, division, were you with? I was with the uh, 9th Infantry Division. Um, we went over by boat to Vietnam, which was a rarity. It was like going over in World War II. We had a client down the side of the ship to get off, to get off the boat. And I served with the 9th MP Company, 9th Military Police Company. And then after three months in Vietnam, we were transferred over to the 196 Light Infantry Brigade, where I served with the 196 MP Platoon military police platoon. And then uh, in September of 67, it changed over to the 23rd Infantry Division, 23rd MP Company. So were you a, a military police? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, we took training uh, when I got drafted in 66. Uh, I was drafted in, in, in the induction center at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And they called everybody's name off where they were going. And I think there was about a 150 of us left here. And we all were together and we said, where are we all going? So the sergeant came up to us, up to us and he said, uh, boys, you're Vietnam bound. So I knew from day one <laughs> that I was going to Vietnam. We were all going to the 9th Infantry Division and they just started that division in April. So we, went, we flew to Fort Riley, Kansas, where we took our basic training and on our advanced, uh, our uh, what's called MOS, our military training. I was going to be a, trained as an MP, military policeman. And then uh, we had some other combat training before we left from Vietnam. So uh, April to November, in November we left for Vietnam by boat. Do you remember the name of your boat? That you uh, yes, I do. I got a picture of it at home, and it's uh, the Barrett. That's why it's what they called the old Liberty ships of the troop ship. And... Um, we uh, took 27 days to get there. Ship couldn't go that fast. It had some kind of a fuel leak, bulk oil. So it, was, it went real slow, <laughs> which, which I didn't know at the time. It's time for me to go home. And the guy's coming up and said, hey, it's time for you to go home. I said, no, I got another month. He goes, no. He says, uh, you left at November, da, da, da. I said, yeah. He said, well, yeah. He said, you went by boat. He said, your time started the day the ship left port. And we didn't know that. <laughs> so that was a nice surprise. So we had like a, a month off of our, we thought, uh, actually being in Vietnam. So. Now, um, so it took 27 days to travel by Liberty boat. Mm -hmm. And what was the ride like over there on that boat? Well, that was an experience. Never been at sea before. Never been on really a boat other than a ferry boat crossing the Hudson River going to New York City. And... Um, so it was just like on the Titanic. I got on front of the ship, right in the bow, and I stood up on there and I'm looking and we're going under the Golden Gate Bridge and the ship started bouncing up and down like this and it was called the potato fields because uh, all the currents came together so that there would be little waves and the ship would just be bouncing along. And I'm going, saying, yeah, I don't feel too good, you know? So I went downstairs and we, had, we were stacked four high and if you rolled over, your nose hit the other guy, you know, right here. And so anyway, I went to sleep and got up and I had to go to the bathroom. And I'm just, what the hell is that smell, you know? And I'm sick to my stomach already. And I get up and I look around and everybody's sick. I mean, we went to the urinal and I mean, it was just like, oh, unbelievable. Guys on the floor hanging in, in the bowls. I mean, guys had paper bags. The whole ship was sick for days. I was sick for three days. And then as a military policeman, we had to work on the ship. We, we had to go down to the food storage area 
where the bulk oil lines were, and we had to stop people from smoking in that area. So you had the smell of frozen food, the smell of bulk oil, you're sick to your stomach already, and you had 12-hour sh shifts down on, 12 on, 12 off. So for three days, I was hurting real bad. But after that, I was better. Some guys stayed sick for, for two weeks. That was an experience. And then we hit the bad storm one night, and the ship is rocking and rolling, and we're in the front hatch, and all of a sudden, the water just starts pouring in. So everybody's screaming, hey, we're going to sink, we're sinking, you know, and everybody's running for their life preservers, and they come over to last. No, we're not sinking. It's just the bolt came loose. We're fixing it now. We're going to tighten it up. Don't worry about it. So, I mean, but I, you know, everything was soaking wet, our beds, everything, the water was just pouring in. And uh, so that was an experience going by boat. Was it hammocks that you were sleeping no, in? No, they were, you know, steel bunks built in, but four high. I got the top bunk, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, what kind of food did you eat on the boat? Um, the food was, you know, like army food. I mean, I'm not a real fussy eater, so I'll eat anything. I mean, to me, the food was okay. I mean, it's obviously, it's not gourmet food, but you were full. And um, they had a little store where you could buy candy bars, stuff like that. And we had some real small showers that we could take every couple couple days. You couldn't take one every day, but every every so often you could take a shower. So it wasn't all that bad. Now that it's over. <laughs> um, being at Fort Riley, now that was your AIT or was that your basic too? That was uh, uh, basic and AIT, okay. both. Now that's an infantry. Mm -hmm. Okay, were you actually on the main base of Fort Riley, or yes. were you? Yeah, on the main base, there was. Uh, I think Funston was one of the camps on there. And I forget the name of the other ones, but yeah, we were, you know, in the old World War II barracks where you had the wooden barracks with the coal stove and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Not that the new ones they have today. Were you on Funston? Yeah, I believe so, if I remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was, wasn't Funston where they actually had a brig for? Oh, the brig? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, it had one on the, on the main post, I mm -hmm. think, yeah. Mm -hmm. They had a brig up there. Matter of fact, I went back there 20 years later. We were, went to a basketball game in Kansas City with my buddy, who's a veteran. I said, hey, let's drive to Kansas City, to Fort Riley. And after 20 years, I remembered how to exactly get to the barracks where I was. I couldn't believe it. I said, turn here, turn here, and boom, we were there. And it was, uh, you know, something to go back to see, you know, where you were <coughs> so many years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you, um, being there... Um, what did you have time off? Yeah, well, in basic training, you don't get any time off. You, know, you may get a weekend here or there or something like that. After your eight weeks training, you got, I think, a week's leave or two weeks' leave. And then you went home and then you went back for your advanced training. And then you got weekends off. Um, we didn't do much. I mean, we didn't have that much money. I think when I was drafted first, I think I was making $66 a month. And I sent $35 home. So I was living on 30 bucks, roughly. <laughs> but, you know, beers were like a quarter. And, you know, you didn't have to buy much back then. You know, your laundry was free. And you're, uh, you had to buy to toiletries. And that was about it. Did you go into the uh, town? Ogden and Junction City. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. And when I went back 20 years later, they had a nice Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Junction City. We visited that, yeah. um, and they had a movies on base, so we went to the movies on the base and stuff. And yeah, we did go into town, but you know, again, you don't have that much money, so what can you do? Can't do too much. And then um, we graduated military police school, and then we, um, I don't know if that was September or October, something like that, we did a little base patrolling um, and then we, uh, you know, got ready to go to you know, to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So we leave in November on a chartered uh, United Airlines flight. We're going to land in Oakland. Now Oakland is an airstrip on a peninsula, surrounded on three sides by water. 
So here we are with our packs, our rifles, our boots on and all that. You know, we're all on the plane. I think it was 150 on the plane, something like that. So we're coming into Oakland and we come down and we land, front wheel collapses. The pilot takes off again. I mean, you look out the window, you feel like you could touch the water. And you know, we're all 18, 19 years old. So somebody yells up, yeah, he goes, we're, you know, we're all young guys. He said, we're, we're all thinking we're going to get killed in Vietnam, but we're going to get killed before we even go to Vietnam. <laughs> so they, we fly around for a couple of hours. And we get our packs and our rifles and our boots off, and they store them all in the bathrooms, and then they foam the runway down for almost a mile, foam, and then the pilot, and all the rescue units are out there in the water, and the ambulances and fire trucks, and the pilot brings the plane down dead center, and just lowers the nose on the last second, and then boom, the whole wheel assembly breaks into the cabin and it fills up with smoke. I mean, there's no fire because of the foam, I guess. And uh, the plane came to a stop and nobody was injured. And we all, you know, we all went down the slides and all that stuff. So that was another experience we had before we even got to Vietnam. And uh, another little short story I'm coming back on the state plane. You know, on, from uh, Chicago to Springfield, and there's a pregnant woman sitting next to me or on the other side, and we hit a storm, and it's a nine-seater state plane into an engine, and we're bouncing all over the place. And I'm, I'm, I'm even coming out of my seat, you know, and I pull the harness down, they put another strap on, and I could see she's petrified. So I said, look, honey, I said, I was in a plane crash already. I said, what do you think the odds are of this plane going down? I said, almost zero. So don't worry, we're gonna make it, you know, so. She felt a little better, <laughs> not much, a little better. Now, when you um, got off that plane, did you have some time in Oakland, or did you immediately no, have immediately to get on your... No, immediately went right to the ship, right to the ship. We jumped on buses, went right to the ship. We were told not to say anything. And uh, that morning, next morning before we left, they delivered all kinds of newspapers, so I got all the clippings and everything of what happened. <laughs> you know, so, but they didn't mention any names or units or anything like that. But <clears throat> we had all the pictures and stuff like that. So <laughs> that was uh, something. So, okay, you, where did you land in Vietnam? Okay, well, our first stop was in the Philippines to take on water. And all the other troop ships before us, could, you were allowed off and go into the villages and drink and that, but the last ship that was there wrecked everything. They got into fights and everything. So they wouldn't allow us off the ship. So we had to stay on the ship, even though we seen land. So a couple of days later, we landed in Vietnam at Vang Tau. And um, it was just like you see in the movies, World War II, you had to use the rope ladder coming down the side of the ship into the LST. And uh, I was in the, the main LST with the general of the division and all the units with all the flags, because I was the guide arm, which is our unit flag, cross them pistols. So we marched off on this self-ceremonial uh, LST and landed with General, and General Westmoreland greeted us um, when we were there, because he served with the 9th Infantry Division in World War II. So that's why he activated the 9th Infantry Division. <clears throat> so we all, we landed there and uh, we all unloaded and we all got on to uh, deuce and a half, so that's two and a half ton trucks. And uh, we lined it on both sides, <clears throat> one, one side pointing out that there were weapons on to the left and the other side with the right. And we drove in a big convoy and we went to a camp called Bearcat, which they just built for us. <clears throat> and um, we stayed there and that's where I started my tour in, in Vietnam. Now, were you the first Ninth Division, Infantry Division? Yes, we were the very first, very first guys. We were the originals, that we call the originals, because the, the, act, the unit was activated when we got drafted, right there. So we were the very first one since World War II, and we were the first ship to be landed in Vietnam. Now, who was your general? Uh, Erickson, his name was General Erickson. He made two-star general when he became commander of the division <clears throat> is an old, an older general, you know, I mean, that was his last hurrah, you know, type thing. So. Now, were you a fresh PFC or fresh private? Um, since it was a brand new division, as soon as you got your 
time, you got your grade. So every, because they had no E2s, E3s, E4s. So every time we got the time, everybody was bumped up. So I made E4 in eight months. Matter of fact, I made it on Christmas Day, 66, um, uh, to E4. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, at a basic training, I was a PFC. And then to E4 after, you know, when I got, I got, I think we got to Vietnam right around Christmas. I couldn't remember the exact date. So how many were... MPs were in your unit? Uh, we had four, we had a company, so I think we had four platoons. I forget the exact number, but don't quote me on this. I don't know, somewhere I think between 100 and 150, 200. I, I forget how big the units were. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, we had four platoons and a security platoon, I think. Yeah, and one of those platoons would do the would be with the guards at the prison. And the rest of them would, would do uh, the other duties, you know, running the base and whatnot. So you were on a brand new base. Mm -hmm. Brand new. And you had prisoners there. Mm -hmm. And what else did you do? Well, we would take, we would just be just like the police in Springfield. We would patrol the base. Uh, we would uh, patrol the, the main gate, convoy escort. This is when I first got there. Um, give out tickets for speeding trucks on the main roads, stuff like that, just like just like they do in town here. Handle all the prisoners. Handle any any problems with uh, soldiers. You know, they might uh, they might have they might have been drinking and uh, got drunk and they got a loaded weapon and now they call you up and hey, take the gun away from Johnny Jones. And that was my biggest fear: is getting killed by one of our own men instead of being killed by a, a, a North Vietnamese soldier. You know, because I mean, you were dealing with these guys and. You know, a lot of them, um, especially later on, you know, were on drugs or alcohol, and you know, they, they don't even know what they're doing half the time. So that's you know, and then, then we would have perimeter guard duty too. First night in Vietnam, very first night. Here we are. We're on a perimeter guard. All right, guys. He said they're going to probe you tonight because they know you're all green troops, and they're going to look for a weak spot and they're going to attack you. Okay. My turn, it's about two o'clock in the morning. I'm out there looking, you know, and I got my weapon in my hand and I'm looking. I see this light out there. He said, holy man, what's that out there? And I'm watching the light. And the light's like somebody's carrying a lantern. You're walking and it's going up and down like this. You know? So I'm looking, I see the light, it's moving, you know. So, boom, I fire. Lieutenant comes over with the starlight scope. That's a scope where you could see in the dark. He looks, and there's nobody out there. Don't do not do any more shooting. He said, because you shoot, and then once you shoot, everybody shoots. So now, I see it again, it's closer. And now, I fire again. Now he comes back, and now he's really mad. He goes, if you, there's nobody out there. He goes, if you shoot one more time, I'm going to court-martial you. So, all right, you know, so and now, this light is even closer. So I said, I don't know. I said, I don't care. I said, I'd rather be alive than, than dead. So I, I, I'd go to jail. I don't care. You know, so I'm getting ready to shoot again. And just as I'm ready to shoot, a flare goes off. It's like daylight. And I look, and right outside in front of the bunker is a little firefly. <laughs> Talking about feeling like an idiot. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, yeah, I laughed and I said, oh, how stupid are you, you know? But, you know, first night there and you're not going to take any chances. <laughs> so were you each on guard duty by yourself? No, we were a couple of the guys there in the bunker. You know, they were sleeping. And, you know. <laughs> well. Yeah, people say, how can you say that about yourself? I said, well, it's funny. You, you know, you learned a lesson. <laughs> right, I did. I did. I did. For sure. I never shot any more fireflies. <laughs> you were safe, though. <laughs> I was safe. Um, did you uh, uh, ever go out and do uh, duty out? Yeah. yeah. Um, in March of 67, we were transferred over to the 196 Light Infantry Brigade. 
and they were uh, to the 196 MP platoon. <clears throat> and we were in the city of Tainan, which was just west of Saigon. <clears throat> and we were there for a month. And then uh, General Westmoreland pulled the Marines out of I Corps up in Shulai. And he moved all the Marines up to the DMZ because he, he really thought that they were going to invade through the DMZ. So they needed another division up there. So they formed what was called Task Force Oregon. Uh, the 196th Light Infantry Brigade, uh, a brigade from the 25th Infantry Division, and the 101st Airborne Brigade. And we formed Task Force Oregon up in uh, July. And when we went up there, uh, the 196th MP platoon, the Provost Marshal decided to put two senior MPs with it, each individual infantry battalion, which was three battalions, roughly 1,500 men, something like that. So we were on Hill 69, north of Chulai, and uh, we were responsible for base camp, uh, policing, um, convoy escort, uh, patrolling the village. Um, and the other big difference was we would go out with the infantry on company size operations and handle all the prisoners and informers that we would have. So we would, you know, go out just like an infantryman, they would go out for 30 days or more. But we, the most we were out for probably was two weeks. Then we get a prisoner, we would bring them back and, you know, get a couple of days and, and then go back again and then come back. <clears throat> so that was uh, one of the big differences that we did. I mean, when I, when they say, when people say, oh, you were an MP, you were in Saigon, you had the shiny helmet and all that. I said, well, no, I didn't. I said, I'd never seen Saigon. <clears throat> so, uh, I was looking on the internet and there was an article in there from the 196 or Americal division and I seen my name and my Joe's name and it said something to the effect where MPs trade shiny helmets for combat helmets now. Uh, they're out in the field with the infantry and they described one incident where there's a big firefight and we had roughly 18 prisoners and Joe and I, we handled all the prisoners and shipped them out of there during the firefight and, and so on. And we took them back, you know, to the camp. And that was, the, what, what, was the, what the article was about. So, you know, I got my share of, uh, you know, seeing combat, but I mean, I wasn't in it the whole time. You know, we had firefights and uh, we got mortared and, at night. And another little funny story at the time, it wasn't funny. We had an informer. So the captain goes, you're responsible for him. He better not escape. I said, don't worry, sir whipped out my handcuffs and I go click, click. I said, he's going nowhere. We lay down, go to sleep. And all of a sudden the mortars come in, they're blowing up all over the place. I jump up, he jumps up, he runs that way, I run that way. It was like a cartoon, we stretch out, boom, we fall down. We get up again, <laughs> the same thing. He runs left, I run right, boom, we fall down. And finally I just started dragging him out. Where I was going, I don't know, but I was going someplace. But you know, after, after it was all over, it was funny. But at the time it wasn't too funny. <laughs> now you talk about Joe. Who was Joe? Oh, Joe was my partner for seven months. We lived together. We uh, patrolled together. We went to the field together. We did everything together. Yeah. Okay. So you, as, as MPs, had partners. And, yeah. And you. Yeah, we had two MPs with each battalion, so mm -hmm. same guys, and uh, we uh, we reported to the lieutenant colonel, and he said, as MPs, he goes, I don't want you, uh, you know mingling with the enlisted men. So he says, um, I don't want you to go to the en enlisted men's bar. He said, you just go to the sergeant's bar, the NCO's bar, he said, even over E fours. And he says, I don't want you living with them. He says, get this, go to supply and get you whatever you need to build your own hooch, he says. So we did that. So we had our own hooch and uh, it was pretty good. We had our own Jeep. We, and he says, you take orders from nobody but me. So life was good <laughs> from that aspect. And, uh, you know, we would go down to the village and, and find guys in there drunk and passed out. And, you know, we never wrote them up formally. We would just take them back to their unit and give them to the first sergeant and tell them what happened, do what you want with them, you know. But I couldn't see writing them up. I mean, these guys were out in the field for a month or more. I mean, they needed a little relaxation, but I mean, some of the things they did was wrong, but 
and I, I couldn't see ruining their career over over that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. When you were over there, and you know you were you were taking informants and, and prisoners back, um, you had a lot of responsibility, mm -hmm. and you, you you know you saw a lot. Um, did you have downtime to be able to regroup or, you know? No, not really, because we were on seven days a week, 24 hours a day, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, we did, uh, Joe, between Joe and I, we didn't tell anybody, but we f became friends with a unit that was in the village down from our base. It was a Marine cap team, a civil action platoon, and it was a squad of six Marines, and they would train the local soldiers to, to protect their village. So we came very friendly with Sergeant Swan, and we said we made a deal with him. He said, "Well, he goes, I'll have one of the Marines drive with you during the day, and you drop Joe or yourself off at the main base and go to the beach and relax." So we did that, and after a while, we got bored with the beach. So Joe and I volunteered to be a door gunner on a helicopter on that day. Now we were young, and you know, think back upon it now, and what a jerk you were. <laughs> But we did that, you know, several times. Now, they wouldn't put us on, you know, really hot LZ, but we were on resupply helicopters, stuff like that. So, I mean, and that broke up the monotony a little bit, but uh, you really didn't have downtime because, you know, you usually work from, you know, 7 in the morning to 7 at night, you know, every day. And so you really didn't have time just to go whew, exhale type. You know, most guys didn't, you know, for the whole time they were there. Because you're always on edge, you know, you're not really totally relaxed. Because you never, especially over there, there was no front lines. So you didn't know, you know, where uh, the enemy was. And then you're talking about downtime. Now, in World War II, I think the most combat experience some of these guys had in four years was a total of like 50, 60 days. And that was it, four years. But a Vietnam veteran had like 250 days of combat out of 365 or something close to that. I mean, they were in combat, you know, constantly. Or in World War II, they would go to a battle, be withdrawn, resupply, restock with men. And then, one, you know, a month or two later, they would go back and do something again for a week or two and come back. But it wasn't like that in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. so you really didn't have time to decompress or anything. You know, other than, you know, like the infantry, they would come back for three days. And he, they even had guard duty in those three days, but still they had they had time to come back and shower and wash their clothes and drink beer and you know whatever. So. Did you take um, anything over as as a lucky um, charm or yeah. whatever? Yeah, my cousin was a bodybuilder and all this stuff. Before I left, he gave me a silver dollar. And he told me at the time, he goes, I bet it in half. I, you know, I said, I didn't want to tell him. I said, there's no way you're going to bet a silver dollar in half with your hands. You know, I didn't say that. I said, well, thank you. And I took that with me, you know, and I came home with it. And I don't know whatever happened to it. It just disappeared. And then um, I remember my uh, parents, when I was graduated high school or something like that, they gave me a gold cross. And I had that on, and um, we were in Vietnam. I was in Vietnam, and I was, I lost it. I don't know what happened to it. You know, it, it broke or whatever. And in Vietnam, the dirt turns to powder after a while. And I was on this compound, and I'm walking, and I see something glitter. And I looked down, and it was the cross. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Wow. Yeah. And I found it, you know, I kept it. And then I gave it to my nephew, I think when he graduated high school. And then his family was robbed and it, it was stolen again. So maybe it'll show up again. I don't know. The chances of you finding that. Oh, it's unbelievable. I don't know how. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. you know, so. so the dirt actually turns into a powder? It's, it, it's just like makeup, you know, powder. You know, it's just like that, like talcum powder. You know, because of the jeeps and the you know, trucks going in the in the compound, and on the road it was you know with more uh, 
hard, but because they use some oil, but just on these little compounds, I mean, you drive around with just dust, and the air was filled with dust when, you know, when you were driving all day long. And we would just drive up and down the highway, you know, and stuff like that, choking on that dust all the time. <clears throat> when you talk about driving up and down the highway, is that the highway that um, the Americans built? No, it was Highway 1, it was called Highway 1, that I'm assuming the French must have built it, you know, in the whenever they first got there. It was along the coastline, it ran, I think, all the way down to Saigon, I could be wrong about that, but, and all the way up north, right on the coastline. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> did you, how was communication from home? Uh, the only communication we had was letter writing, and I wasn't very good at that. I would write, not every day like some of my friends did every day to their girlfriends, I mean, I just, I just, I don't know what they could say every day. I mean, you don't, you don't, first of all, you don't tell them what's happening. You know, you don't say, uh, I just killed this guy or, I, you know, this guy died, my friend, or you don't say anything like that. But, um, so I never wrote much. I'm not much of a writer anyway. And then we did have a, a phone service and it was very strange. You would make your call to the operator. The operator would say, okay, and then she would explain directions to you. When you finish talking, you have to say over, and then the operator would flick a switch someplace, and then the person you're talking to could talk, and then they would have to say over, and then she would flick the switch back, and then you could talk. So I called twice home, I think, or once, I forget. Maybe once to my girlfriend and once home. But that was the only communication we had, other than letter writing. And you could write a letter or you could write on a, on a piece of cardboard that your meal came in, your box, and they would mail that. As long as you had the right address, it would be delivered. Really? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Did you get um, things in the mail, like goodie boxes? Oh, yeah. I remember one night uh, I came back and there was a box there and my uncle sent me a box of, I remember, pickles and cheese whiz and crackers and a whole box of Slim Jims. And if, so I had all the guys there, and we all you know, ate, ate everything up that night. We finished everything. But uh, yeah, every time somebody got a, a goodie box, I mean, uh, we just uh, ate everything right away. Yeah. Um, was there anything special that, you, know, you talked about Slim Jims, was there anything that, anybody got or that you got that was just phenomenal? Oh, probably uh, when they sent homemade cookies, you know, chocolate chip cookies a lot. Or uh, somebody they would send chocolate cake or a cake, you know, in a box with popcorn all around it and everything. And that was just, you know, like, wow, this is great. Would you even eat it if it was stale? Oh, yeah. yeah. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. And most of the time it wasn't stale because they would wrap it in tinfoil and uh, and whatever they did, you know, I mean, it wasn't the freshest thing, but it wasn't terrible. They put it in a metal box or a can or, and put tape around it. So it's pretty good, especially that homemade food. That was really good. How about um, like showers and fresh clothes? Mm -hmm. Well, when you were out in the field, like for 30 days, you, you had no clothes. And, and the thing that I noticed the most was when you were out in the field and we were out like for two weeks, that the ammonia in your body got so strong that, as you know, if you open up a bottle of ammonia and put your nose on, you go like this. Well, if you smelled yourself, <coughs> it was that strong. So you could, you could rinse your clothes off in a stream or something, you know, but that was the only time to change your clothes. Other than that, and you might well your sock. They wanted you to change your socks all the time. Didn't want you, they didn't want you to get trench foot, put powder in your boots and all that. And as soon as you did that, you walked right in the water right after that. So I don't know why they made you do that. So. <laughs> yeah, but no change, no clean clothes. But when we were on the base, we could send our clothes out to the villages, and they would wash them for a fee. And then where we built our hooch was right next to the PX. So. And Joe and I someplace found a 55-gallon drum with a spigot on it, you know. So we put it up, we found a, a stand, and built our own shower. Poured a little concrete pad. So 
we went to the guy who runs the PX and said, hey, whatever his name was. I said, hey, Bob. I said, you want to use our shower? He goes, yeah. I said, well, you just make sure that when we want a case of soda or a case of beer or whatever you got in there, you got it for us. He goes, no problem. Now, we paid for it, but we, we, we would get it. He would make sure we had it. So we let him share our shower. So. Was the water hot or was it Well, it, it was hot because it would be out in the sun all day long. Just like if you go to Mexico, you see those big tanks on top of the roof. The water, the sun heats it up so they got hot water. So that was nice. Mm -hmm. When when you talk about soda and beer, did it come from America? No, and they had a manufacturing plant. Uh, Coca Cola did in Vietnam. The beer thirty three was made in Vietnam. They had imported American beer. Um, I don't remember them all the brands, but Budweiser and Schlitz and Ballantyne and Schaefer. And there was a beer from Korea, Crown beer. And uh, they had a PX where you could buy, you know, whiskeys and stuff like that, not hard alcohol. <clears throat> and then we had our little uh, uh, bar set up where you, you know, get beer for about a quarter a can or whatever it was, I forget. <clears throat> and uh, we had our little hooch girl and she would, you know, get ice for us. We have a cooler and we had soda and beer in there for ourselves. So. Was, was the soda, did it taste like home? The soda, the Coke over there had a little different flavor to it, but it, it was good. Mm -hmm. When they always told us, though, don't buy any soda in the village because they put battery acid in it. But, you know, yeah, you know after a while, was, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm thirsty. And the same thing in the field. Um, I mean, you get so thirsty, it was so hot there that, you know, you look at this water and you would, you know, right now you would go, oh, God. But over there, I mean, you, you filled your canteen. If it was brown, you didn't care. I mean, you were so thirsty, you just wanted to drink it. And uh, it reminds me of a story of a friend of mine. They stopped, filled up their canteens by the stream. So they, they, everybody's rested, the point man goes out, and, they're, and of course, they're walking in the stream. And he gets up further, and he goes, Holt, and he goes, what's wrong? He goes, tell everybody to empty their canteen. He said, there's three dead gooks in the river. <laughs> And the water was flowing this way, so everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, then, and then when I came back from Vietnam, I had no symptoms, but nothing related to the military. I, I had knee surgery and I uh, had a low grade fever. It wouldn't go away. And, uh, you know, 199 wouldn't break. I was in a hospital five and a half weeks. I had no appetite. I lost 35 pounds. The doctor said, well, we're going to operate on you again. I'm going to give you two more tests if they don't come up negative. He says, you know have to operate. So the nurse comes back, you've been down south? I go, no. South America? No. She goes, far east? I go, yeah. Just got back in November. She said, that's it. She said, you got parasites in your intestines. And she said, the type that you have lay dormant until your immune system comes down and then they activate. And that's what happened. And she said, they could lay there for years. I took a pill for 10 days and they were gone. But I never knew it. I had no other symptoms. And you've never had any no, problems no, since? And no, none, none whatsoever. Mm -hmm. no. um, so you you talked about Joe. Do you still take, stay in contact with Joe? Yeah. Um, every year, well, first couple of years I came back from Vietnam and I went back to college and all that. I never did anything about the military. Never talked about it much. <clears throat> and then uh, the Chicago parade started. 80-something, whatever it was. <clears throat> and that's when I I tell people, quote, I came out of the veterans' closet and uh, got active, active in the veterans' community. So then I said, well, I'm going to try to get a hold of Joe. So every Christmas I would call, and all I knew was he lived in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I call up, I said, I'm looking for Joe Island. Uh, no, Joe Island can't help you. So every year I call, call. Finally, I called one time and she goes, well, she says, I don't see anybody, but let me give you my supervisor. So she gets on the phone. I explained to her, Joseph T. Ireland. She goes, well, is it Joseph T. Ireland in Allentown, Pennsylvania? She said, you want me to connect you? I said, yeah. It's Christmas morning, early. Now, hello, is this Joe? Yeah. I said, Joe, this is Joe Ireland? Yeah. 
Joe Allen from the 196, Light Infantry Brigade in Vietnam. Yeah. I said, Joe, this is Roy. Dolgus, remember me? Yeah. And I go, I'm going to myself now. I said, what the shit? I'm all excited. You know, I'm happy, you know. I go, uh, how you been, Joe? Good. Um, Mary Joe? Yeah. Got any kids, Joe? Yeah. Boys? Yeah. Girls? Yeah. And finally, I said, hey, Joe. I said, you got a pen and paper? I'm going to leave you my number. If you feel like it, call me back. So I was all disappointed. You know, I was pissed off. And anyway, that night, <clears throat> he calls. And he goes, sorry, man. He goes, I was so hungover. I, 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 he goes, I, I, you know, I didn't know what I, was to, what I was doing. And he says, I'm really sorry. And after that, we got together. Every two years, we have a reunion. And uh, every, no, we just, I just left him in Washington a couple of weeks ago. We, uh, we get together almost every two years. So, Do you get, get together with any of the other guys? No. I haven't ran into anybody. One time we, we ran into our old provost marshal, and we didn't know him that well because we were uh, out with the second and the first, and he was on the main base, so we never really seen him that much, so we didn't recognize him right away. But afterwards, you know, after talking to him, you know, we, 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 we kind of knew. So he... And then he got all timers, I think, because I haven't seen him at the last couple of reunions. So I don't know what happened to him. So you do go to reunions? Oh yeah, every two years. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. you and Joe, or no, no, the whole. I mean, the whole. Yeah, we had a almost eight hundred for dinner for the banquet. About five, six hundred veterans and their wives and family. So it's uh, it's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Even though we don't know anybody else, but now we know them because we've been going for so long that you, you get to know the other people. But we didn't know him in Vietnam. Really? Yeah. Now, um, um, do you also ever go back to like Fort Riley and? Yeah, I went back once. One you time. said that once. Yeah, one time in, 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 twenty years later, and I, that's quite a few years ago. I, mean, I drove past it a couple times on my way to Denver, but I never stopped. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. oh, excuse me. Um, what about uh, any, like, do you recall the day that your service ended, did, you know, and you came mm -hmm. back from oh, Vietnam? Uh, coming back from mm -hmm. Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got in uh, late at night into Seattle. We went to Fort Lewis, Washington, and uh, they fitted us for, you know, winter uniforms. And they said, okay, while well, we're sewing all your patches on and everything, go get a dinner, eat as many steaks as you want, and baked potatoes, you know, whatever you want. Shower, get cleaned up, whatever. Got our uniforms, got our paperwork. I still had uh, three months left in the service, or four months. And back then they said, if you have under 90 days, you can get an early out. Well, I go up to them, I said, look, I got 120 days. I have 30 day leave, 10 days travel time. I said, that brings me under 90 days. No, it don't work that way. You got to have 90. So anyway, I come back and um, the first thing I did was, you know, get a ticket to fly to Chicago to see my girlfriend. And uh, didn't tell her I was coming. <laughs> <coughs> Stayed with her for three days. And then I went home. And the same thing, you see your parents. That was my last, you know, coming home. Did um, so they didn't know you were coming home, okay. and you showed up at their door. It's kind of that like that commercial when the boy comes back from Africa and his little sister is waiting up for him. For him oh yeah, yeah, and yeah, 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 uh, yeah. the coffee's being brewed, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, you know yeah. it's a good feeling. Yeah, I called my buddies up. They picked me up, and. Uh, my parents were in the kitchen making dinner. 
Yeah. It's a nice feeling. It's a nice feeling. So the welcome home was wonderful. It, it was really nice. Now, I have a question to ask you. Mm -hmm. um, you sh show on here that you have a bronze star. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good, nice award, a special reward. Do you remember who gave that to you? Um, no, because I was out of the Army. You were out of the Army. I was out of the Army. I was in college. My parents called me up and said, I got a package here from the government. I said, well, I said, well, I was married. And I said, well, well, we'll come home this weekend. And it was, uh, I got, you know, I <laughs> received a bronze star. And I'm thinking, what, you know, why did I get this or whatever? And, uh, you know, I called Joe up and he goes, yeah, he goes, I got one too. And when we were over there, um, we were out on some operation and we came back to the, we would go to the, ba the main MP base once a week or a month to get our mail. So we went back just one time and they were all coming up to us, hey man, you guys are heroes. And you, you know, I said, why, what are you talking about? He goes, well, yeah, he says, we heard. He said, you guys led that infantry up that hill for that attack. I said, no, that wasn't us. I said, we didn't do that. Well, yeah, you're going to get this medal and all this stuff. So, you know, I told you, I said, well, you know, we, we can't accept it. We didn't do anything like that. And he goes, I know. But we told the Provost Marshal. And uh, nothing more was said about it. But uh, what it was, I think, we were in, um, in ground operations against hostile forces. So for seven months that we were with the 196 attached to the second or the first, we were with the infantry and doing things and dangerous things and and then, you know, we would be on the road at night sometimes, stuff like that. And so anyway, and it just for, for being in, I guess, for that, not many enlisted men get that medal, you know, other than for valor. And you know, there's two, you get it, one with a V for valor and one for meritorious service. And Joe and I got ours for meritorious service. You know, we did see combat, we did fight, but it, not for one Pacific you know, valor issue. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you is, you went back to school. Yeah. And did you use the GI Bill? Yes, I did. I got, I was married and I got my $216 a month for nine months a year. And um, I went back and um, I was supposed to go back and play basketball at this small school, Division II school. Um, I had a tree fall on my leg. And anyway, they said, well, you know, I still come. And uh, my first year, we had a, you know, a little apartment. And then, we, then they got me a job, or I got my wife a job as director in a girl's dormitory. We had our own housing. And, uh, you know, she, she graduated already. So she, she was working, making a little bit of money. And uh, we had this free apartment. And we went to school. I got the GI Bill, and I worked during the summer, and um, we lived very comfortable. And then I, my sister graduated junior college. I said, "Come on up." I said, "You can live, you know, rent free for two years." So you know, she did that because we had an extra bedroom, and uh, we both graduated together, and we we're the first ones in our family. Wonderful. Yeah. And you mentioned that you stayed underground as a veteran mm -hmm. for several years. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that was? Well, it wasn't a very popular thing to say you're a Vietnam veteran. And um, during that time, and as you know, in the late 60s or early 70s, that was the start of all that black power stuff. And, um, you know, veterans were, were not popular, you were called baby killers and all. I mean, that never happened to me, or people spit on you, and that didn't happen to me, but you didn't mention that one. I didn't join the Veterans Club in college, and uh, I think I did one interview when I was finishing playing basketball and, and mentioned that I was, you know, a Vietnam veteran, but uh, other than that, I, didn't, I never did anything. Uh, I did use the VA a little bit when I was there to finish up some work or my my dental work, but other than that, I, I wasn't associated other than the GI Bill getting my check every, you know, month. Yeah. Um, do you feel that that has changed now? Oh, absolutely. 
and I want to say it, it changed because of the Vietnam veterans. You know, we, anything that we got, we got ourselves. You know, we did the work to build the, the wall, I mean, the monument, I mean, the walls and the, the Vietnam Veterans Wall in Washington. We did our own parades, uh, the biggest parade in Chicago history, and uh, Vietnam veterans. <coughs> and I think we helped to change the opinion of the, the, of the civilian people. You know, what they did to us was wrong. So now they recognize the soldier, you know, for what they've done, and they don't blame him for the war, where they blame us for the war, which is politicians and political, not the individuals. We just did what we were told to do, and we did it well. So, and and that's one other point I want to bring up, they talk about the greatest generation. To me, any generation that defends their country <clears throat> It's the greatest generation, not just World War II. So. Um, what is the most positive thing that you took away from your time in the service? The most positive thing that I took away was the greatest experience of my life. Good and bad. Because you've seen things, you've done things that no one else can say it here, but done. You had the uh, learning experience of working with different ethnic groups. You had the experience of working with a team, um, disciplined, uh, all that stuff. It taught you how to be, uh, how to come to work on time, be drug free, you know, be a good worker, work overtime, you get the job done, you're not a crybaby. No, I mean, I, I think it uh, really develops you as a person, the service. I think everybody should go into it, man and woman. Even if they don't go into the service, there should be some kind of credit given to you for going in. You know, you, you do your six months in the service. You come out, you serve in the Peace Corps, you serve at a VA hospital. You, you, you do something for your country. You got to serve your country some way, one shape or form. And I think everybody should, should do that. One thing um, I would like to ask you, and you kind of touched on this, but Vietnam, the service time in Vietnam was a time that over here, um, generations were feeling um, racial tension. Mm -hmm. um, we're feeling a lot of things. But you being over in Vietnam, how were you? Were you feeling any of that? No, it didn't start yet. I mean, we had that, you know, we had issues with, with, with the, uh, you know, black and Hispanics, but it, it wasn't really as bad as it was in the 70s. I mean, it got to a point where um, they would, you know, it would be like the, you know, whites here, blacks here. Uh, but when I was there, if you were in combat, and you were with blacks or Hispanics and whites, everybody was like this. Because they knew that their life depended on you and vice versa. Now, when you got back to camp, that was a different story. You know, they would go off by themselves. We would go off by ourselves. Some of us would, you know, mingle. And I mean, I played sports, so I, I had no issues with that. And, uh, you know, we hung out, in, in the, you know, drinking with the guys and stuff and, you know, singing songs and whatnot, I, I, I had no issues. So, but later on, I understand after we left, they got really bad, real bad. And the army had a, after Vietnam, they had to regroup and refigure things, how to do things better because of that. Did you have any entertainers come over? To yes. See? Yeah. I, um, I was on the main gate at Bearcat with the 9th Infantry Division, and she pulls up, and who is it? Martha Ray. Now, she was in the active duty reserve. She was a, a, a lieutenant colonel, and, uh, you know, they saluted her. Just, and she went through the gate and said, you know, hi, boys. And, and then I seen um, um, Nancy Sinatra in Long Bend in January. So five, six years ago, 
I'm at the U.S. Old Wall in Chicago. And sitting next to me is Nancy Sinatra. She's going to get an award, Black Dye event. So she goes up, she comes down, sits down. And I go, Nancy, congratulations. She said, oh, thank you. I said, Nancy, you don't remember me? And she goes, remember you? I said, yes. I said, Vietnam, January 67. She goes, oh, yeah. She said, in Long Bend, right? And she said, there were 100,000 people there. I said, right. I said, don't, I said, don't you remember that tall guy in the back? with the green shirt and the green pants. And she breaks up laughing. She goes, get over here. She goes, I gotta have a picture with you. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, we've seen her and I, that's the only one I've seen. I never seen Barb Hope and we had a couple of, you know, Filipino bands and some uh, Donut Dollies come around and, uh, and um, you know, local talent. Well, I have to ask, did she have on her white go-go boots? No, she did not. No, no. And she's only about this big. She's really tiny. <laughs> Is there anything? Oh, well, yeah, in January, she did. When I was there in 67, she, had, she? Yeah, these boots are made for she walking. That's what she was thinking. Yeah. 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 Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I don't think so. I'm just... Um, thought it was... Uh, Great time in my life. <clears throat> and I really wouldn't trade it for anything. Well, Roy, I would like to say thank you for serving our country, doing such a wonderful job. I would also like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview you and hear your story mm -hmm. firsthand. I, I appreciate it, doing it. Yeah. And hopefully uh, somebody will hear it. I'm sure they will. Thank you very much. Thank you.